When accepting his Nobel Peace Prize, the humanitarian and Holocaust survivor, Lee Weisel, said, and I quote, wherever men or women are persecuted because of their race, religion, or political views, that place must, at that moment, become the center of the universe. As we look around the world today, there are far too many places where men and women are persecuted because of their race, religion, or political views. But a place that really stands out is the nation of Burma. The Rohingya people have endured unimaginable pain and suffering since August of last year, with assaults by the military and nearby groups in Burma, 350 villages have been burned. Women and girls of all ages have been raped. Over 700,000 Rohingya have fled their nation for neighboring Bangladesh to escape this horrific, horrific assault. In just the first month of this crisis, Doctors Without Borders says well over 6,000 Rohingya were killed, including hundreds of children under the age of five. As one UN advisor on genocide prevention has said, the Rohingya have endured what no human beings should ever have to endure. Now we are seeing the brutality of the Burmese military followed by a deliberate strategy of isolation and starvation. Several times in recent years, Nicholas Kristof of the New York Times has traveled to Burma to report on the Rohingya. Earlier this year, he entered the country on a tourist visa. He was warned by the Burmese government not to do any reporting, but he did. He traveled to a total of five Rohingya villages, working hard to be able to see these places in which everyone was banned from going. Back in November, a group of five members of Congress went to visit these same villages. And we had two senators and three House members. And we were told by the government of Burma that we would be allowed to visit the villages. But at the very last moment, the government rescinded its invitation. Now, two months earlier in September of last year, the leader, Aung San Suu Kyi, had said to the United Nations that Burma had nothing to hide, and the international community was welcome to come and see for themselves. So five members of Congress went to see for themselves and for their constituents, and to be able to report back to the entire nation, but weren't allowed to see these camps or these, uh, these uh, villages that had been burned. But Nicholas Kristof, he did succeed in going. And here's what he said, and I quote, what I found was a slow motion genocide. The massacres and machete attacks of last August are over for now, but Rohingya remain confined in their villages and to a huge concentration camp and are systematically denied most education and medical care. And he continued saying, so they die. No one counts the deaths accurately. But my sense, that's Nicholas Kristof speaking, my sense is that the Myanmar government kills more Rohingya by denying them health care and sometimes food than by wielding machetes or firing bullets. Matthew Smith from the human rights group Fortify Rights said, and I quote, these tactics are right out of the genocidaires playbook. 
underfeeding, systematically weakening the population has been characteristic of other genocides. Now we weren't allowed, the congressional de delegation wasn't allowed to go to those villages to see for ourselves. We were allowed to go to Sitwe, the capital of Rakhine State, where the Rohingya live. And in the capital, we were told we could visit on Mingalar, and it's also called the Muslim Quarter. And I am standing, when I took this picture, I'm standing in the Muslim Quarter looking down the street, and what you see is a police station at the end of the street and a, a barrier. This neighborhood is cut off from the rest of the capital. If you think of the early stage of the Warsaw Ghetto, when people were not allowed to leave the neighborhood, that's what's happening right this moment in the capital of Rakhine State, in Sitwe. It's illegal for them to leave. In fact, the folks who live there have stores that have been locked up and shut for years because they're not allowed to leave this neighborhood and go open their stores. There is a hospital right around the corner, and they're not allowed to go to it. Instead, they have to get safe passage to a camp, an internally displaced person's camp, outside of Sitway, get to it, get a referral slip, come back to Sitway to get to the hospital. Incredibly difficult logistical challenges placed between this neighborhood and the hospital that's right next door. Now this happens to be in the capital where folks can stand along these fences and make trades for food and they can receive on their smartphones uh, international support. But imagine if you took this neighborhood and lifted it out of the city and placed it out in the countryside where there's no supporting community around the outside. Maybe no cell service, so you can't receive money on your cell phone. There are 120,000 people living in these camps, IDP camps, in Rakhine State, 120,000. And then think of those folks who fled those 350 villages that were burned, that fled and saw their family members shot, their family members raped, their family members burnt inside of the huts that were torched in those villages. Now, what Nicholas Kristof is saying, the folks that remain are being subjected to slow motion genocide through starvation and deprivation of medical resources. This is beyond acceptable. That condition is a form of ethnic cleansing. It is a form of genocide. And the United States should be absolutely vigilant in leading the world to respond. Now those folks who fled the safety, fled to safety in Bangladesh, they're also continuing to experience extreme hardship. This is a picture from the hillside where we were, there's still a few trees standing, but the trees have been coming down to provide firewood and to provide various little supports to keep the houses upright. Mostly these little houses, these little shelters are being built on split bamboo that's split into a very tiny piece, put in, tied up into a, a frame, and then plastic is draped over it. Hard to imagine what this camp is going to look like when the monsoons hit. Now the monsoons were supposed to hit a few weeks ago. They haven't yet, and, but they could hit any day now. And these camps are going to become a devastated mess when that occurs. There are now 900,000 Rohingya, 700,000 from this last horrific year, and several hundred thousand from previous episodes in which they were attacked by the military. Terrible sanitation makes this, these camps a breeding ground for cholera, diphtheria, and measles. And there's a lot of concern that when the flooding comes with the monsoons, that will be when the sanitation systems overflow, contaminate the water, and cholera epidemic will follow. 
As Save the Children and other aid organizations have said, the Rohingya refugee crisis is a children's emergency. The camps are full of young men and women. This little boy here, he had built a little tiny kite and was flying it around just a scrap of plastic and two little scraps of wood. And when I first saw it, I saw it fluttering in the, fluttering in the air. I thought, what is that? And uh, he brought it down and, and showed us here, and you see the shadow uh, on the ground. Children just trying to be children, making a little toy. But this young man and the other children, they're the lucky ones who got out alive because the survivors tell us about infants being ripped from their mother's arms, thrown alive into the burning fires, toddlers murdered in front of their families, countless teenage girls and even younger raped, infants and young children in both the IDP camps and the refugee camps are still dying of disease and malnutrition. And those surviving now have to grow up in camps like this. Where will they go? How will they thrive? They have to figure out right now just how to survive day to day. When I was in Bangladesh, and at this camp, there was an international group that had set up a tent and was enabling the kids to come and play games, uh, to draw pictures, to sing songs. And this young man here, by the way, here's Congressman Cicilline from the House side. Uh, this young man here was showing me the drawing that he had made that shows helicopters shooting at the villages. Uh, and uh, this is a piece of what these children had experienced. And many of them had drawings of helicopters and trucks shooting at the villagers as their families fled. So I hope that the children have many joys like making and flying kites, but they are carrying these scars we cannot even begin to imagine. So now these children, homeless, without a school, access to minimal health care, have to figure out how to go forward. In one of Nicholas Kristof's articles, he spoke to a 12-year-old child in a camp and asked him, what do you hope to do when you grow up? That's a question we often ask children. What do you hope to be? What do you hope to do? And the child responded, quote, I don't have any dreams. That's a fairly heartbreaking response. Young age, dreams crushed, just the challenge of surviving day to day. Every child in the world deserves to be able to dream. The Rohingya in Bangladesh today are facing an impossible challenge. They are in a refugee camp that is full of hundreds of thousands of people with inadequate infrastructure. They would like to be able to reclaim their villages, return home. And quite frankly, Bangladesh, which is hosting them, would like them to be able to reclaim their villages and return home. But they can't do so without enormous effort on the behalf of the very government that sent its military to annihilate them. They need international protection. They need a change of heart of the leaders of Burma. Aung San Suu Kyi is a Nobel Peace Laureate because she stood up for democratic process and suffered years of home detention as she pushed to have democracy restored. So we in the world have expected her to stand up for this community and say it is unacceptable for these Rohingya families to be persecuted, this community to be persecuted in this fashion. But she has not stood up. And I know so many members here have encouraged her to reverse course 
and stand up and not be part of this ethnic cleansing and part of this genocide. Only with her change of heart, only with her championship, only with her determination to have Burma respected on the international stage and human rights respected in that nation, will the return be able to happen. Right now, there's no expectation this can occur. However, there was an interesting story this past week. Earlier this week, a Facebook post on the official page of Burma's Information Committee showed this family being repatriated back. A family of five being repatriated. They were being checked out medically. They were receiving packages of rice and mosquito net and blankets, according to this post. But you know what? No one really believes this story. There's no international agency involved in protecting this family. Were they even refugees to begin with? We don't know. What we do know is that the story itself said they're not going to be able to return to their villages or their village. They're going to be sent to an IDP camp, an internally displaced persons camp. There's already 120,000 people in camps from previous episodes like this. Those are prison camps. So why this is meant as a public gesture to the world that Burma is going to protect this family, Burma is sending them to a prison camp. Let no one in the international community be fooled. And the publicity campaign also showed them receiving national verification cards, but not citizenship cards. They're not being welcomed back as citizens. They're still being stripped of their citizenship. So even in their best effort to pretend that they're doing something positive, this family is being denied citizenship and sent to a, a prison camp. The international world must respond. And how are we to do so? Let us all encourage the President of the United States, our President of the United States, to speak about this horrific international case of genocide and ethnic cleansing. Since August, we've not had one word from the leader of our country about this horrific crime. We need to hear from our president. The world needs to hear from our president. Second, we need to pass the repatriation resolution that has passed the Foreign Relations Committee unanimously calling for the safe and dignified, voluntary and sustainable return of the Rohingya people that demands that the United Nations must be part of any formal agreement. It has the unanimous support of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Let's put it on the floor and have the unanimous support, unanimous support of the U.S. Senate as well. Third, let us have on the floor and pass the sanction bill called Burma Human Rights and Freedom Act. This too has passed committee. This targets the military that perpetuated this genocide. It doesn't allow those military leaders to travel to the United States. It doesn't allow military weapon sales to Burma. It cuts off military cooperation, except for humanitarian cooperation and training to target the military that perpetuated this crime, to send a signal that this is unacceptable. Who else in the world, what dictator in the world is looking at what has occurred in Burma saying we too can drive out a minority community we've gotten tired of? The U.S. must respond and forth. We need to invest in the education of the children who are in those refugee camps. They're there with no schools. If it takes several years for them to find a permanent home, if ever, we can't afford to them go years without education, without schools. Let the international community invest in their education and let the United States lead in that effort. And let's give strong international support to Bangladesh. Bangladesh didn't have to open their borders to this flow of 700,000 refugees from across the river in Burma. But they did. In a humanitarian way, they did. They said, we will not let you be shot down on the banks across the other side. Come and find refuge. But now the government 
of Bangladesh needs international financial support. They are a poor country, poor in a way we can't even imagine. That nation is half the size of Oregon. And when it floods, it's a quarter size of Oregon. Now, Oregon, my home state, we have four million, four million citizens. Bangladesh already has 160 million citizens. There is no space. That's why these camps are crowded onto hillsides, carved into the dirt, because there's no place for people to be set up on flat land where it's easy to establish facilities. Those five things are what we must do. For our president to be a vocal international leader and bring the international community together, to pass, second, the repatriation resolution, Third, to bring to the floor and pass the sanctions bill, the Burma Human Rights and Freedom Act, to send a message to Burma and to the rest of the world, to invest in the education of the children, and fifth, to give strong international support to Bangladesh, which is doing all it can, but is in a very difficult spot to receive so many in an overcrowded and impoverished nation. Ellie Weisel said, wherever men and women are persecuted because of their race, religion, or political views, that place must at that moment become the center of the universe. Let us then make Burma and the refugee camp in Bangladesh the center of the universe and come to their assistance.